I recently hit the milestone of 200 subscribers, so first I just wanted to thank everyone for supporting my content. Every bit of interaction really matters, and it gives me the motivation to keep making videos. Due to this, I wanted to make something special, so here's my 200 favorite horror films. Note these are my favorites, not necessarily what I think are the best or most influential, or anything like that. This is my list, and it's going to be pretty different from anyone else's. I'd like to hear your favorite horror films in the comments below. Without any further ado, we'll begin by discussing my 200th favorite film, Urban Legend. This was released in the Scream era of slashers, whodunits with a lot of fairly generic characters in a middle America setting. The twist here is the kills are based on urban legends, so there's the man in the back seat, pop rocks and soda, and a stolen kidney. It's a lot of fun, and while it's definitely a ripoff, the kills are well done and there's a solid villain performance. Get Out is Jordan Peele's first film, and I've got it lower than a lot of people probably would have. For me it's got a great idea, and the ending sequence has some really smart stuff, but it takes too long to get there, and I didn't like the best friend character. He felt too over the top for the rest of the film. Still there's some genuine terror, as well as good social commentary, so it deserves a place on this list. THE Final Destination is the fifth entry in the franchise. The general opinion is the films are basically all the same but there are a few things that set them apart. The whole franchise is an enjoyable watch, especially the opening sequences, but it's often let down by terrible characters. There are definitely some assholes in this one, but most of the survivors are likable enough, and there's an incredible ending twist, making this one of the best after the original. Leprechaun 3, The Little Shit Goes to Vegas. The whole concept behind the Leprechaun franchise is ridiculous, and Warwick Davis in a little green suit just isn't intimidating. This entry knew that, and has the most fun with the setting, having the theme of greed shouted from the rooftops. It also featured Stretch from TCM2, which is always a plus. This, or Back to the Hood, are the best ones in the franchise, but 3 just goes that little step further with some of the absolutely ridiculous scenes. Sleepaway Camp is a fairly run-in-the-mill slasher, one of dozens of attempts to be the next Friday the 13th. What sets it apart is a sardonic sense of humor, pretty solid effects, and the ending. The comedy aspects are played up even more in the sequels, but the absolute inhuman scream at the end of the first film is not. That's something truly unique, and makes it stand out from the rest. Evil Dead, the 2013 one, is one of the goriest films ever made. It understands that the Deadites are gross, disgusting creatures and goes over the top in mostly the right ways. The problem is it doesn't have any of the black humor from the rest of the franchise, and as a result it comes off more like a hot topic interpretation missing the heart and soul. Despite this, the ending is super memorable, and it helps to bring the franchise to a new audience. Peeping Tom is one of the first ever slasher films, released in 1960, a few months before Psycho. It's much less of a slow burn or mystery than that film, and instead places the viewer in the perspective of the killer, with his camera becoming the audience's. It's a deeply disturbing film, with a focus on voyeurism and the nature of art versus reality. Despite its age, it still really holds up as well as being important from a historical context. Vivarium is the stuff of my nightmares, a surreal sci-fi look in suburban hell with the two main characters trapped in a never-ending sprawl. Not a lot happens, and it's not hugely scary, but it's got some Lovecraftian elements of existential dread going on that I very much enjoy, and the child character is that sort of old-school Twilight Zone horror where it works well in the setting. Fresh is one of the more recent films to make it to the list, having released last year. The biggest strength of the film is the genre turn, the first half hour or so being a fairly well acted if generic romantic comedy. Then the cannibalism starts. The portrayal of the main villain feels very real, and there's a genuine sense of dread and fear in all the encounters between the protagonist and him. My biggest disappointment was the lack of body horror in a film that seemed like the perfect place for it, but I can understand why they didn't want to glamorize what he was doing, or appeal to the meat freaks like me. From Dusk Old Dawn is another genre twister, or maybe it was Titty Twister half gritty crime film, half bombastic vampire slang, and all sex bombs dick pistol. It's no surprise that Rodriguez and Tarantino work together on this one, and it's an absolute blast. I can completely understand the people who hate either half, but they both worked for me, and I don't feel like the twist lessens either part. It's definitely pulpy, but sometimes those are exactly the right kind of films. Renfield is the most recent film on this list, and it has a lot of similarities with Dust Till Dawn, Vampires, excessive gore, trashy in a major way. I'm definitely a cage head, as indicated previously, but 
This one is just a ton of fun. The comp plot, like it often is, is boring and definitely dragged the film down when it focused on it, but the hot vampire action was really solid, and I appreciate stabbing a police officer with an arm. It just works, you know. I actually think Cage isn't at his best here. It's a fine performance, but it's closer to Wicker Man than Mandy. Note that the it I feature here is not the most recent films, either part one or part two, but the TV miniseries from the 90s with Tim Curry. This was one of the first horror films I saw when I was in fifth grade, and it left a big impression. I didn't have trouble sleeping or anything, but Tim Curry drifting around in a clown outfit was quite something. Ignoring nostalgia, I still think it's a pretty decent adaptation, keeping most of the good stuff and ditching the sewer train. The acting and effects are not the best, and the ending sucks in every world, but Pennywise is an iconic villain because of this film, and he deserves that reputation. Tremors really should be higher. It's tightly written, has great characters, neat effects, and some good tension, but it's just never grabbed me in the way that I want it to. In general, creature features are one of my least liked subgenres, so while I can appreciate the technical aspects, the emotional part just doesn't work for me. That's why I don't have Jaws or Godzilla on here. I get it, I just don't like it. Still, Kevin Bacon and Burt managed to win me over with this desert classic. That's probably another reason I can't put it higher. Too much sand. Don't Breathe is a well-crafted film with a solid twist that really understands tension. Having a blind villain is not revolutionary, but it allows the sound design to shine, and every little creak to be magnified. He also changes roles throughout the film, from an innocent old man into a truly vile villain, which is something horror doesn't do enough, and I always appreciate it. It's also a film that doesn't need a sequel, although one was made and somehow made the original retroactively worse. Sinister is a film that relies on a few terrifying moments, with an otherwise lame villain and standard haunted house story. But this is the one that a few times it works. The old video's trope is a common one, but the ones featured here are so incredibly creepy, and the lawnmower jump scare is genuinely one of the best in the 21st century. The rest of the movie? Eh. But if singular moments are impactful enough, it barely matters. Only Lovers Left Alive is a vampire tale, but a very non-traditional one. It's more of a love story than horror, but this is my list and I can do what I want. Tilda Swinton is amazing in this one, and despite the romantic nature of the film, it still feels like violence is creeping around every corner, and when it does erupt, it's suitably brutal. The soundtrack is also of special note, and something I still listen to when writing. The Babadook has become a bit of a meme in the horror community, as its popularity has been a double-edged sword but it's a really solid film about grief and depression, and the villain is suitably scary. The kid is annoying, but nowhere near as bad as people make him out to be, and there's a reason it's cited as one of the earliest elevated horror films. Mandy is a wild good time, and it's got Nick Cage having a chainsaw duel. What more could you ask for? Well, more of a plot, maybe. Mandy has so much potential, but it falls just a little bit flat for me. I think it's just not quite wild enough, aside from the colors, which are spectacular. The urban fantasy components are great, and some of the individual scenes I still think about, but as a whole it feels too disconnected to be great. Halloween is a classic for a reason, one of the progenitors of the slasher genre, and the beginning of a 13 film franchise. It's got good tension, some great kills despite a lack of blood, and builds off the Michael Meyer persona so well. It unfortunately lacks a bit of logic, with Michael driving and teleporting, but those are minor flaws in a film that's really about atmosphere and it nails the titular holiday perfectly. I do wish they had continued with the original anthology idea, with different stories told about it, but it's always about the cash, and maybe Season of the Witch was reason enough not to do that. Black Sheep is probably one of the more obscure films on this list, because it's a Kiwi one. Released in the mid-2000s, it's basically about zombie sheep, and there's a were-sheep in there too. It's wrapped up in New Zealand sensibilities, but despite the premise, it plays it all fairly straight which lets the humor shine through in unexpected ways, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's definitely not for everyone, but it's a lot of fun. The third Alien film has a storied history. It's from David Fincher, and after the first two were so good, what could go wrong? The answer is a lot, and Fincher basically disowned the film due to executive meddling. Despite this, the assembly cut, released on home media significantly after the original, is quite good. It features a wide variety of changes including the original host animal for the alien from a dog to an ox. It's a much darker film, and plays more with the themes of religion and isolation. It's definitely not perfect, only so much can be done with what was filmed, but it's a big improvement and a worthy entry in the franchise. 
Glorious is another recent addition, and the whole concept for it is fairly wild. An eldritch horror is stuck in a restaurant bathroom and needs the help of some guy to prevent the end of the world. There's more to it than that, with lots of mythological references, twists and turns, and some pretty interesting visuals despite its single location. What really sets it apart, however, is J.K. Simmons as the god, who is commanding in almost every role he plays. I love Rebecca Hall in almost every film she's in, and Resurrection is no exception. It's a very slow burn about a woman's descent into madness due to an abusive ex coming back into the picture, who is played by Tim Roth. While it does take a bit to get going, it so perfectly encapsulates that kind of trauma that can come from that relationship. It also nails the ending, which is always a substantial challenge for these kind of films. Freddy vs. Jason, a matchup decades in the making. Now is the film good? N no. Is it a particularly good nightmare film? Also no. Are any of the characters likable in any way? Well, you get the picture, but all of the nonsense is worth it for the final scene where the two horror icons just go apeshit on one another. Is this in the worst film on the list in terms of objective quality? Although it's probably bottom five, but it's just such dumb fun, which works for the 80s horror it's meant to be evocative of. Creep is an extremely effective found footage film that is cemented by its ending. That's the number one thing that needs to work for me to enjoy a film, and this one nails it. The build-up to the insanity is very well done, and the structure of the film, basically just two guys talking, allows for a thorough examination of both their characters. The sequel is also on my list and is equally strong, although a little bit lower. Hellraiser is my 50th favorite horror film. Honestly, all the films from this point on I view as great, so the exact placements don't really matter. Hellraiser, like Candyman, is horror rooted in lust and desires. It's got some of the best score from the era, but the one that sticks out to me most is when Larry's hand hits the nail and it scrapes along it. It's also the introduction to the Cenobites, and features a fairly active protagonist, which is a nice change from the slasher era. The Night House is another film with Rebecca Hall, and is genuinely some of the best jump scares of the last decade. I'm not the biggest fan of that type of scare, but done right it sets the tone for the film, and this film does it right. It's also got interesting dreamy visuals, and a good sense of dread. The plot is fairly interesting, and goes in directions that are unexpected, but the clues can be pierced together beforehand. Is End of Evangelion horror? I say it is, because the whole franchise has some of the most fucked up images you're gonna get. End is understandably the finale to Neon Genesis Evangelion, after they ran out of money during the original run. It's got some absolutely brutal violence, devastating deaths, and an ending that is almost as baffling as the original, although there's a little bit more closure. It's the end of the world as we know it, but I feel fine? It follows as a strangely nostalgic film. It's set in an indeterminate time with e-readers but no cell phones, the perfect time for horror. The monster itself is terrifying, with a few key scenes that still stick with me. Yeah, the characters are a bit dumb, but it's shown that there's no stopping it and whatever their attempts are, they were going to be futile. The movie is elevated by its concept, but sometimes that's all that's needed. Manos the Hands of Fate is definitely the worst film on this list. And yes, watching it looking for scares, atmosphere, audible dialogue, or a story is pointless endeavor. But it's such an earnest attempt at a film, and I can't help but love it. It really was made on a bet by a dirt farmer, and it looks the part. It's not one I would put on necessarily to enjoy, but the story that surrounds the film is what makes it one of my favorites. Candyman is more of a romance than it is a slasher. The first kill occurs over an hour into the film, and the greater focus is on the social issues and the idea of the Candyman. Few other films have embedded an idea into the culture like this one, which has become a modern day Bloody Mary. The real meat of the picture is Tony Todd's performance, and specifically voice. Without that, there's nothing, but with him, it's a classic. While the recent sequel is fine, it just couldn't match the pure energy of the original. Ginger Snaps is an incredible coming of age film, wrapped up in werewolf trappings. There are few enough werewolf movies, especially in the last couple of decades, but this one has great effects and really explores the idea of becoming a monster. It also has a good sense of humor, something that has continued on into its sequel. The Thing is one of the best bottle films ever made. Taking place almost entirely in a small arctic base, it really evokes the feelings of claustrophobia and paranoia. Couple that with creature effects that still haven't been matched and some of the best jump scares in all of horror, as well as a tightly written script that keeps the audience guessing and you've got something special. I wouldn't fault anyone for having this as their favorite film. It's definitely my favorite of John Carpenter's. Young Frankenstein isn't a horror, you say? Well, we'll go to Homer Simpson's opinion on that one. 
And hey, a lot of films on this list aren't scary or thrilling, but have the trappings of the genre, and that's enough for me. Young Frankenstein is the best parody film ever made, because of a loving devotion to its source material, down to using the exact same sets. Not recreations either, but the original props. And that's something special. It's also just hilarious, and overall great. Now we'll slow down for my top 10. First is The Blair Witch Project, the most influential found footage film ever made. While the effect can certainly be ruined for people today, at the time the viral marketing campaign made many viewers believe it was actually real. Even without that, it's heavy in atmosphere, and the ending is still so damn effective. Ginger Snaps 2 takes everything that made the original great and adds even more darkness, transporting the setting from suburbia into a rehab clinic. Endings are what define how I feel about a film, and the ending of this one is so uniquely dark and terrifying. The actual villain is revealed to be a 12-year-old girl, and then she wins, and our protagonist is doomed. It's definitely not everyone's cup of tea, but everything about this one works for me. Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vermin is the perfect capstone to the slasher genre. It's a mockumentary that describes and dissects the classic tropes with an incredibly unlikely pair of protagonists. Some dislike the ending, where it transitions into a traditional filmmaking style and embraces many of the elements it had been lampooning, but it's really the only direction they could have gone with it, and it further cements the film as a love letter, maybe a breaking up letter, with the genre. Murder Party is defined for me entirely by one scene. Our hapless protagonist has managed to escape from his art credit captors who want to kill him and film it. He hides in a closet, and there's a brief montage of him grabbing equipment. The closet opens, his hands full of stuff, and then he just tosses it on the ground, does a little half step in one direction, then runs off in the other. And it works, at least for a little while. I adore horror comedy, and this one is definitely heavier on the second genre, but it's a solid parody of the modern art scene. What is there to say about Silence of the Lambs? Every performance is incredible, with individual lines that I can picture, down to the inflection of each syllable. The final night vision scene is incredibly tense, but only works so well because of everything leading up to it. We understand who Sterling is, and thus need her to succeed. The fact that Lecter has never caught further bills on the mythology of the franchise makes it seem like it's more than just a film, but part of a greater story. Which it is, but it's rare that a Finch film maintains that feeling. Nightmare on Elm Street 3. What can I say? I really enjoy a film set in an asylum or clinic. Not hospitals, though. Halloween 2 and Kills can suck it. Dream Warriors is the best realization of the concept of the franchise, with creative kills, an intimidating Freddy, and a plot that stays relatively grounded. I first saw the film late at night on TV, and only made it up to the scene where Freddy parades the kid around like a marionette, but that was enough to cement it in my memory as an all-time classic. Donnie Darko is a lot of different genres. I think almost anyone who's seen the film would view its icon, Frank, as a horror character. There's a real sense of dread, with this countdown accelerating throughout the film, and the mask design is genuinely brilliant. Of course, the film is also a sci-fi romantic comedy, so horror is definitely not its solitary genre. Donnie Darko was one of the foundational films for me, with concepts I hadn't seen before like a downer ending, fate as a choice, and even some of the ideas that it dismisses, like love and fear. Just don't watch the director's cut. It's impressive how much worse it is. Scream, the slasher of the 90s. It managed to revitalize horror as a genre, as well as provide meta-commentary that had previously been toyed with in New Nightmare. It's got two of the greatest villains, with just the right amount of overacting, and genuinely good scares and tension. The one thing that really elevates it above all the other imitators, however, is that opening scene. Seven minutes in heaven, killing off the big-name star before the title card was a bold move, and it paid off enormously. It's also one of the best-paced films ever made, with kills placed at just the right moments. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I literally wrote a book about this one. It's the most culturally significant film, with messages that are still relevant today about capitalism, the meat industry, media, and the nature of evil. It also has one of the most effective first kills in a film, creating something that had basically never been seen by the audience before, especially not American ones. Of course, it was held to film, with injuries aplenty, but that pain comes through. So much of the horror industry harkens back to that one film's success, not to mention all the films that took inspiration from it like Alien, Halloween, Green Room, Wrong Turn, and all of Rob Zombie's filth. It's genuinely a perfect film. It's not my favorite film of all time, however. That one is May. It's a little more obscure, but it's a film that speaks directly to everyone who has ever been lonely and wanting a connection with someone. It's a deeply human film, and while the protagonist is stranger than most, 
There are elements to her that speak to all the little bits of awkwardness that pervade everyday life. When things go wrong, we feel for her. And when things go really wrong, we fear her. It's such a perfect medley of genres and stories, ultimately becoming a thematic adaptation of Frankenstein. I love this movie so very much, just like I love all of horror, from good to bad. Well, that's my list of my favorite horror films. If you sat through this, thank you. And really, I can't tell you how much it means to have people watch my content and enjoy it. I hope to do this for a very long time. Be well.